Welcome to r slash pro revenge, where revenge is a dish best served frozen. Okay, so this story took place back when I was in Florida in the early 90s. It does involve an act of vandalism that is connected to revenge. Hopefully it won't be removed and hopefully it'll count as nuclear revenge. Anyway, South Florida was devastated by Hurricane Andrew. My dad, as part of a local charity, was set up day after day at a local market seeking donations from shoppers to give to food banks. You have to understand, this storm left many people homeless and without power in some cases for six months in Florida heat and humidity. My father was legally disabled from a serious car accident. He was hit by a drunk driver in the early 80s and suffered from relentless hip and back problems. It never killed his heart or kindness to others, hence the charity work. One day, he was about to pull into the disabled space at the local market to go buy a few items to donate to the hurricane charity. Right before he is about to pull in, this lady pulls into the space in this shiny red Porsche. My dad parks behind her and says, excuse me ma'am, I was about to pull in there, and also points to his disabled placard in the window. She says to him, you don't look disabled, and proceeded to walk into the store. For anyone who has a relative who uses a disabled space, you know the frustration of this situation and the anger one feels. My dad, seemingly unfazed, waits until she goes into the store and then gets out and snips the valve stems on all four tires, flattening but not destroying all of them. He then pulls into another space not far away and just waits. About 15 minutes later, the lady comes out and is shrieking about her car being vandalized. My dad is far enough away that she can't see him, but he can hear everything. She calls the police. Big mistake. She files a report for vandalism, and the police give her a ticket for being parked in the disabled space with no placard, about 250 bucks at the time. The cops leave, and she calls a tow truck. As the car is being loaded into the truck, my dad pulls up and says to her, you don't look disabled, but your car sure is, and then drives off. My dad could be a nice guy and pure savage when he needed to be. Our next Reddit post is from a long string of numbers, and this story is a long one, but man is it a good one. Four years ago now, when I was 24, my mom died of breast cancer, and as both my grandparents also had died of it, I saw a specialist for screening. I found out I had some cells in one of my breasts that could have turned cancerous at any given moment. I was told I had a few options. One, I could have regular screenings every three to four months until it does develop into cancer. I was told the risk of the cells becoming cancerous was very high due to family history, but it could also potentially never turn into cancer, so I'd just be getting these screenings for no reason. Two, I could get a single mastectomy on the breast with the bad cells, but they need to keep an eye on the other ones, so I'd still need regular checkups for the other breast. Three, I could get a bilateral mastectomy and remove all of my breast tissue, basically eliminating the risk. I went for the bilateral mastectomy. It was admittedly the most drastic option, but after seeing what cancer did to my mom and grandmothers, I didn't want to risk it. I was warned about scarring, but told it should be fairly minor. It wasn't, and I was left with two huge, pink, jagged scars on either side of my chest, each about an inch long and half an inch wide, and it caused me to go into severe depression, where it got to the stage of me not even leaving my flat because I didn't want people to see me, throwing out my mirrors, and getting physically sick looking at myself. I went to a therapist who suggested a plastic surgeon. The therapist said they normally never do that, but it was clearly something I was struggling with and I might never get over it. And the therapist could see why I struggle with it. Although I'll admit the therapist did send me to ask about scar reduction. The plastic surgeon suggested a cream, a laser or implants. The cream didn't work and the laser was both expensive and risky. So I went with the implants. My natural boobs were an F cup, so I went with a slightly smaller double D. Since then, my mental health has improved and I feel a lot better about the way I look. My confidence has gone up, as has my self-esteem. I know I shouldn't put so much into my appearance, but I wasn't exaggerating about these scars. Huge, bright pink, jagged, raised, just really awful to look at, and I hated seeing myself. 
and they are now nicely hidden away and you can barely feel them. In the present day, I'm 28 years old and working in an office. I'm doing a lot better than I was. My coworker, Jill, found out I'd had a boob job, but not the cancer thing. When myself and my friend from years before the mastectomy were planning a holiday and she made a joke about me going on a plane with my implants and Jill overheard. By the end of the day, the entire office knew I'd had a boob job, but not why. And half a dozen people confirmed Jill had told them. Over the next few months, Jill made many jokes and comments about my chest to coworkers when I was in earshot. At one point saying I had more plastic than Barbie and calling me fake in two ways. I didn't hear this one myself, but a friend in the office told me that Jill had at one point referred to me as a sack of silicone. I don't know what her problem was exactly, but at one point she mentioned the National Health Service. So I assumed Jill thought I'd got my breast done for free on taxpayer money. I'd gotten the mastectomy on NHS, but gone private for therapy and implants. I'd asked her to stop more than once, but unfortunately the places I talked to her were places like the lift and the woman's bathroom where there weren't any cameras. And Jill just kept making comments no matter how often I asked her not to. I wouldn't say it was every single day, but I heard at least three comments per week for three months. I hit my breaking point when me, Jill, and a few other coworkers were having lunch. I referred to something as being shallow and Jill said, you know all about being shallow, while gesturing to my chest. I snapped. I said, do you know why I have these? A few years ago, the doctors found potentially cancerous cells in my breast tissue. I was advised to get a mastectomy and was left with huge, ugly scars on my chest. I went to see a therapist who sent me to a cosmetic surgeon who advised me to get implants to hide the scars. And I did it just so I could look at myself in the mirror without crying. So maybe next time you wanna judge someone for having cosmetic surgery, you should ask them why they had it first. And feeling like that was a mic drop moment, I picked up my food and left. For the rest of the day, I had about one third of my office come up to offer me support. And the rest tell me that Jill was just joking around and I was being a jerk. I replied that Jill was being a jerk long before I was. I then got an email from HR saying they wanted to talk to me the following day. And when I called for clarification, they mentioned a hostile work environment. Note, this is apparently an American term and holds little weight in England, but it's what was said over the phone. I knew the person who signed off the email and I'd spoken to. Her name was Debbie and she was Jill's friend in HR, so I was fairly confident on who had reported me. I realized that if this was already being sent to HR, I needed as much ammunition as possible, so I went about collecting my information. Since Debbie had dealt with me so far, it was safe to assume she would be the person reviewing the complaint with me. And if that was true, I was screwed. However, I vaguely remembered a section on complaints that was in my contract when I first signed with the company. I flicked through the contract and there was a part in the complaint section that said I was contractually allowed to request a change of reviewer if I felt my allocated reviewer was biased. It was called an impartial overseer. I photocopied the page and highlighted that part. Then I messaged the people who had offered their support over Facebook and basically said, HR has asked to see me. Do any of you remember Jill insulting me to your face and are you willing to write and sign something saying what you heard and when? Not everyone was willing to help as Jill is somewhat feared in the office due to her befriending HR and management, but about 20 people were willing to help me. I got to work slightly early the next morning. I went around to everyone who had messaged me and most of them managed to give me a printed and signed letter. Some didn't manage to write one, but no big deal. This isn't the exact wording as there's 16 letters to sum up, but here was the gist. My name is blank. I work with Jill blank and OP. On a certain date and time, approximately, I spoke with Jill blank, during which she referred to OP as the quoted insult. 
I felt this was inappropriate as it directly related to OP's appearance and I'm willing to go on record to further establish that Jill Blank has been discussing OP in the workplace in the same manner for three months now, causing me discomfort and creating what I feel is a hostile work environment, signed Blank. I wound up with about 16 letters, all from different people, and one of them was in the lunchroom for my conversation with Jill. Some even had bullet pointed lists of everything Jill had said to them about me or other people. As it turns out, Jill has issues with a lot of people's appearances. She apparently made comments about one coworker's weight and apparently something anti-Semitic about a different coworker's nose, all of which were put in these letters. There are about 45 people in the office, so while 16 wasn't a majority, it's still a decent amount. The letters weren't hugely long, most were only a paragraph, but they had all the necessary information. I was asked to come to HR at 10am. I took the letters from coworkers, the photocopy of the page in my contract, and my dates and times in the little folder with me. I got there, and Debbie was the one overseeing the interview. She got up from her desk, ready to lead me into another room. I immediately turned to the other HR worker that was currently there and said, so is my meeting with you then? Debbie said, no, you're with me. I replied that this wouldn't sit well with me as my contract states I have a right to an impartial overseer. And as I said this, I took the contract page out of my folder. Debbie read it. I wouldn't let her take the paper when there was a shredder so close by, and she said she could be impartial. I replied that I really didn't mean to be a pain, but I had it on good authority that the person on the other end of this complaint is her friend, and my contract does say I'm allowed an impartial overseer. Debbie stomped off to get the supervisor. The supervisor asks how I know she can't be impartial, and I tell him that I have it on good authority that Jill, who was on the other end of this complaint, is a close friend of Debbie. He asked Debbie if this was true, to which she only replied, I can be impartial. <sighs> supervisor took a deep breath, asked the other HR rep to come with him, and the four of us all went to review the complaint. I thanked them for being so accommodating. I was worried I'd annoyed them. Debbie took out the complaint and all three of them went through it with me. Debbie looked homicidal the whole time the interview was happening as she had clearly anticipated firing me or at least recommended me for being fired. The interview went something like this. It took like over half an hour and they kept asking me the same questions but phrased different ways so this is a really drastically condensed version. You said outside that you think Jill reported you. Why is this? Jill has had an issue with me for about three months now. Why didn't you come to us when you realized Jill had an issue? I had no issue with her. What issue does Jill have with you? Then OP describes everything that happens with the breast implants. Why do you feel this is true? Here's 16 signed statements, all from different coworkers, all testifying that Jill told the entire office I'd had breast implants on the day she found out and has since made comments about these implants frequently. They have quotes about what Jill said to them about it and rough dates and times. Rough dates and times? No one knew this would be escalated to such an extent, so no one really took notes as to when it happened. What event or events do you think directly led to this complaint of harassment? For me, harassment began when Jill told everyone about my breast implants without my consent, but as to the complaint against me, it would probably be what happened to me at lunchtime yesterday in the lunchroom. Jill made a comment about me being shallow while gesturing to my breasts, and I replied by giving her an abridged version of my relevant medical history and ending with a comment about the importance of getting the full story. There are cameras in the lunchroom, so I'm sure you'll be able to find the conversation. I'll admit I could have handled the situation better, but after three months, I felt I had to put my foot down. Here's a list of names of people who were also present. There were six people at the table, including myself and Jill. One of these people is also in those letters and has written their account on the conversation and signed it. Had you had a conversation with Jill prior to this regarding her comments about you? Several spaced out over the last three months. Each time I communicated to her that I felt uncomfortable and upset with these comments she was making and would appreciate it if she were to stop. 
To your knowledge, was Jill made aware of your former cancer at any point in this time? No, it wasn't mentioned in the conversation with my friend she overheard, and I didn't tell her because, frankly, it's none of her business. And I didn't feel the need to detail my medical history to a coworker in order to avoid further sexual harassment. The supervisor stands up and says, well, I think we're done here. He shakes my hand and sends me back to my desk, saying I'd hear from them after they'd reviewed the evidence. Letters, CCTV, medical history, and anything they had already, and made a decision on the case. I got back to my desk, pulled up my resume, and prepared to start the job search again. About an hour goes by. Then, the person who wrote the letter and was there for the lunchroom conversation gets called for a meeting with HR. They come back about 10 minutes later. The other people who were also there for the lunchroom conversation get called one by one, except Jill. All of them are gone for about 10 minutes, then come back, find a coworker, and say that HR wants to see them. Then, the people who wrote letters but weren't there yesterday are also called one by one and are each gone for about 10 minutes each. Some longer, some shorter. By about 3.30, it looks like everyone who wrote a letter or was there in the lunchroom had been interviewed. Then, finally, Jill gets called in. She's gone for about 30 minutes and comes back fuming. She glares at me while I work, but I ignore her. At around 4.30, Jill gets called into HR again. 5 p.m. rolls around. Everyone is either leaving or getting ready to leave. When Jill storms back into the office, she glares at me the whole time she packs up her desk. She then starts telling anyone who will listen that I got her fired before shoving her way onto the lift. An email comes in from HR. My case is closed. So OP, it sounds like Jill fell for your booby trap? That was r slash pro revenge. And if you like this video, be sure to hit the subscribe button for more daily Reddit content.